My name is Mitch Gruber. I'm a member of Rochester City Council, and I want to start off by extending my condolences to Daniel Prude's family and to the entire community that is grieving his tragic death while in police custody. On September 2nd, this community learned about Mr. Prude's death that had taken place more than five months earlier. Since that night, there have been peaceful protests in downtown Rochester every single night. On several occasions, law enforcement deployed chemical irritants like tear gas and mace and shot pepper bullets at protesters. One night, law enforcement used a long range acoustical device, otherwise known as an LRAD, to try and disperse protesters. In short, the threat and reality of these devices has made protesting in Rochester dangerous. And none of that even mentions that we're in the midst of a pandemic. Yet the protests will continue as the community grieves for Daniel Prude. So this event is to talk about the health and safety of peaceful protest. I wanna be clear that this event is not to talk about or analyze why the protests have become dangerous places. The Rochester City Council has and will continue to demand the protection of peaceful protesters and de-escalation by law enforcement. There is certainly a time and place for more on that conversation, but today I am joined by a group of remarkable people who want to talk about the health and safety of protesters. So I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves, and then we'll start with some questions. First, I want to, I want to introduce Teresa Bowick, a local nurse, a health advocate, and the founder of the Conkey Cruisers. Good afternoon. It is my distinct pleasure to be on this Zoom meeting and to share some information with our community and certainly want to thank you, Councilman Gruber, for bringing us all together because it's critically important that we have that conversation with our community and give them some tips and some information as to how to stay safe at this time. I have been a nurse for the last 26 years. I, my greatest claim to fame is truly just being a community healer and a passion for the people. Thank you. Next, uh, Shani Wilson, a physician's assistant who has treated multiple people down at the protest and is working with volunteer medics in an administrative role. Shani? Hi, everyone. So my name is Shani Wilson. I'm a physician assistant and I have been a uh, PA for about seven years here in the city of Rochester. I've worked in internal medicine and also medication assisted therapy um, for as a number of other things over the years here. So I am working in conjunction with the Rochester um, Medic Collective to make sure that the protesters and anyone else that is harmed during these protests are safe. And so that is the reason why I am here uh, to kind of give a voice to those that have been um, harmed during this process. Thank you, Shani. And finally, Dr. Michael Kamali, doctor, uh, who's a doctor and of course the chair of the Department of Emergency Medicine for URMC. Hi, uh, thank you very much for, for having me. Uh, I feel real privileged to try and provide some information and help our community. Uh, I'm Mike Kamali, I'm the chair of emergency medicine at the University of Rochester Medical Center. Uh, I'm an ED doc and work at Strong. Great. So I think we should start where um, a lot of the community has been asking uh, some really critical questions about the, the impact of the chemicals that have been deployed over the last few weeks. Um, I know that uh, I myself have been down at the protests, um, have, um, have in inhaled the, the tear gas, been shot by pepper bullets. I know the same is true of Nurse Bowick and I believe Shawnee as well. And this is true of, of truly hundreds, if not thousands of people. So I'm wondering um, from, the, from the three of your perspectives, what, what are some of the major concerns that the community should be thinking about in terms of uh, these chemicals? And on top of that, um, what do people need to do to be able to treat them effectively? And anyone can jump in. Nurse Bogue, you're on mute if you're if you're jumping in. I was just saying that we let Dr. Kamali start uh, oh. from the hospital perspective, and then now I'll jump in. And Shawnee has a lot to offer there. Great. Sure. So, so happy to provide some some input. I, I guess I would preface it by first saying that that my sincere hope uh, is that all the protests would remain peaceful, uh, so that we don't have anyone who's injured at, at all uh, from the events. I, I truly believe in the right to uh, peaceful, uh, peaceably uh, protest, uh, but I also point out that our emergency departments and our hospitals are, are busy enough. So. 
we would uh, like to not have any injured protesters or injured police officers uh, to have to come to, a, to our department. We'd like to see everything remain peaceful. In terms of uh, the item, so really what we're talking about here are is pepper balls or pepper spray. Uh, the pepper balls are sort of like paint balls in terms of the way that they can be shot. So they become uh, projectiles that in and of themselves uh, can cause harm and discomfort, oftentimes bruising and that sort of thing. And then they release pepper spray or capsaicin uh, that is a pretty powerful irritant, uh, but it's also similar to that that is uh, placed into spicy foods. Uh, but when those substances are, are breathed in or get into the eyes, they can cause some pretty significant irritation. Uh, the same holds for uh, what we uh, commonly refer to as tear gas or CS gas uh, is a substance uh, that also when it comes in contact with mucous membranes, the eyes or the lungs can cause pretty uh, significant irritation. Uh, most of these substances, though, when used outside, they dissipate relatively quickly uh, so that the irritation can be short-lived or can be not as intense as what might be intended. Uh, these items, though, when used in close contact or in an enclosed space, uh, can raise some significant concerns, uh, especially to people with underlying health issues such as asthma or COPD or emphysema. And then in terms of the auditory device, um, th that is something that it's a projected sound uh, that's in a very narrow range, but can be very loud in terms of its decibels. Uh, but with that, um, it's, it's intended to scare people away from a particular area and or uh, make announcements in a loud enough way so that people in that area can hear it and hear it above any other, any other noise. Uh, Dr. I, Dr. Kamali, I, I want to come back to the LRAD. I sure, think that's sure. a specific conversation we ought to have, but specifically in terms of the, the pepper balls, the tear gas, I believe I, I, I've seen people talk about mace down there as well. Um, anything else you want to add before we hear from uh, Nurse Boa Prashani? Well, the intention with these items is, is to cause irritation and then to disperse crowds. Uh, the problem becomes if uh, concentrations are high or they're in an enclosed area that they can cause some pretty profound irritation to people. But in general, these are considered to be um, just irritants, uh, but they, uh, you know, it's concentration dependent and how close you are to anything. And if anything is fired in your direction, because oftentimes they are uh, projected into an area or at protesters. Right, I think the proximity is a key point. And I, I would turn to, to Nurse Bowick, who I know um, was down there and um, uh, early, I, I believe it was the first Friday night you were down there. And uh, do you wanna share your experiences and, and how you uh, uh, dealt with it with the folks you were with? Oh, absolutely. So we started out with prevention and being prepared for the protests. So we took along with us, we had water, we had tearless baby shampoo. In addition, we did have milk, we had a lot of gloves. In addition, we did have milk, we had a lot of gloves, we had a lot of hand sanitizer, and we had a lot of extra masks to ensure that people could be safe. Because it's critically important that we remember that in the midst of all these protests, we are still in the midst of a pandemic that is spread airborne. My experience was that my daughter was hit with one of those pepper bullets and that impact was an instant injury to her foot and then the burning. We were able to rinse, 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 rinse her foot, but at the same time there was tear gas in the air, so there's coughing. So when we talk about those pre-existing conditions and those factors that people are coming to the protest with, my daughter is asthmatic. And so now her, her breathing is compromised. And then you add on the exposure or possible exposure to the COVID-19. COVID and that's what we must keep front and center when it comes to preparing. I also want to remind the community that if you are using milk, and there's a number of healthcare providers that are advising against it because milk does have milk sugar in it and can set you up for pretty nasty eye infection. So you want to make sure that if that is your choice, that you are rinsing, rinsing, rinsing your eyes or wherever you're using milk to cool the impact of the pepper spray. So prevention 
is important, ensuring that you are going to the protest, that you are equipped with your first aid, that your cell phone is fully charged so that you can have contact, that you're not alone, that there's someone with you. But seeing people injured there with the impact of those pepper bullets in their eyes, there were a number of direct hits to the eye. Yep. So and I, and I, eye injuries. And I know that Shawnee has, uh, has treated a, a lot of the folks who, who did see some uh, direct contact. And I, 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 I'd love to hear your experience, Shawnee, if you want to also talk about um, specifically in relation to these chemical irritants, some of the kind of most severe injuries that you've seen and, and you've treated over the last couple of weeks. Yeah, so there's a lot to say here. Um, we so actually was uh, present when Nurse Bullock brought her daughter to see me in the triage area. And, um, you know, we've had, we've had folks that have been exposed to pepper balls, tear gas, and um, the medics that I've been uh, fortunate to volunteer with have been collecting these pepper balls and keeping them so that we can uh, figure out like what actually and who's been actually exposed to what different types of pepper balls. So what we're seeing is that there have been people that have been, there's at least two people that we know of that have lost the use, that have lost an eye or use of one eye. Um, one person had to be, um, I, uh, within the last two weeks. And so, you know, I didn't treat the eye, the person that actually had the severe eye injury, but I've been treating those that and sending them to area hospitals that have had, um, like, uh, if they've had a pepper ball that hit their glasses, right? If they've had um, a pepper ball that has, um, like, hit them right in the face and caused, like, um, like, a like cuts to their faces. So we've sent people in for suturing. We've sent people in for um, concussion, concussion evaluation. We've sent people in for, um, uh, for people that have had burns from uh, pepper balls. Um, I had one person that had a silver dollar sized burn, like we call it like a road rash type of exposure um, on, their, on their lower right groin area from um, a ricocheted pepper ball that actually got on their skin. And so these, they're, they're painful. They're, um, we treat them like burns. Um, we have, uh, people will show up to these protests with not a lot of personal protective equipment on. You know, we've been fortunate that people are wearing, um, you know, their regular COVID, COVID recommended guideline masks, which is really amazing and wonderful. So thank you to Rochester for that. But when it comes to, you know, showing up at these protests, one of the things that I want to strongly recommend is that, you know, just like, um, you know, that has been discussed here that you bring, um, if you're an asthmatic, make sure that you have your medication on you. Make sure that you, um, you know, you can have a fully charged phone, but if something happens and you lose your phone, one of the things that the, retic the medics recommend is that you write your phone number on your arm or another identification just in case you're arrested or that you are lost from your phone or from the crowd if the crowd is dispersed emergently. Um, another thing that we recommend is that, you know, we have like, um, uh, there's military grade, grade goggles that are relatively cheap that probably cost around twenty dollars. I know that there are there are specific types of safety goggles that folks want to wear, like swim goggles, are not necessarily recommended because they actually cause suction on the eye and can cause significant eye problems. Um, so instead, you know, please, if you want to go to your you know local area hardware store and pick up some really extremely durable goggles, because if it if something ricochets and hits you from the ground or from your, if it's coming to your projectile to your eye, and if you're wearing glasses or if you're wearing just something like plasticky that you picked up at the store, like at the dollar store, it's not gonna work and it's actually gonna cause further injury. We've had people that have had um, uh, uh, dislocated shoulders. We've had people with um, contusions, right, uh, right area contusions in their upper chest. I've had people that have had um, tear gas canisters that have exploded near them and they've ended up with shrapnel in their, shrapnel in their chest. So when we talk about actual you know, war size or war area um, injuries, this is it. And really, you know, the city of Rochester was never prepared for something like this. And you know, these are people that are young, that are out here protesting every night peacefully and with intention. And I just am you know, just at a loss as to why these things are being used in the first place. Yeah, uh, now I, I, I totally agree and um, heard Nurse Bowick talk about milk. Um, yes. uh, Shani, Dr. Kamali, does, uh, does someone want to just give a sense of what is, what is best practice for treating um, the, the irritants um, as they're deployed? 
Well, it, as best you can is to wash them off, uh, ideally with uh, just plain water, yes. uh, capsaicin. There's you know, some thought that milk can help with that, and some people like that better. I th think the comments about uh, washing and rinsing your eyes is uh, very, uh, uh, very appropriate. And Shani, is there, has there been, uh, or Nurse Bullock, has there been adequate water down there from your perspective? So we've, we've been receiving, I'm sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Um, so we've been receiving uh, incredible amounts of water. Um, we have a lot of it. And so we always welcome donations and we have multiple areas that we can provide um, online. They've been circulating through Facebook where people can donate bottles of water. Um, so I also agree, you know, with, um, with, with everyone uh, as far as like uh, making sure, you know, I strongly recommend water because the issue is getting the irritant out of your eye, not necessarily um, the, the neutral neutralization comes from getting it out of your eye. And so we have, um, we have just like, uh, like squeeze bottles that we're using to just get that out of the eye as quick as possible. And so, yeah, we have plenty of water, but we can always use more. Great. Nurse Bulk, were you going to add something there? Oh, not at all. Shani covered it. Mm -hmm. So I, w I want to raise one, one last question about the, uh, the chemicals. And again, I'm, I'm happy to take uh, questions from the media as we go through a couple other topics we want to talk about. But there have been a number of people who have reached out and uh, specifically uh, with concerns about uh, reproductive health as a result of these chemicals. And I, I think that's a really critical thing to, uh, to acknowledge and to try to understand. So I'm wondering um, if, if anyone has any comments on that, what the, what the data shows, what the major concerns are there. One thing I can say is the fear. And what comes with the fear is the increased stress. And stress in itself kills. And so we're finding that people are just afraid, afraid that when they're exposed to these chemicals, what's going to happen to me? And that is the thing that I really want to be able to address and to talk to people about dealing with the fear. And if you are afraid, finding that person in your social circle to have that conversation with and not just keeping all those things inside. You know, people have been complaining of the inability to sleep. You know, just the skin irritant, the, the scratching and causing those areas further, further damage. And so I don't want us, you know, we certainly have experts out there that can talk more to the research and long-term effects, which I'm not aware of that, but I want to talk about what's happening right now today and how people leave those protests with this sense of a black cloud hanging over the top of their heads, with this sense of sadness for Rochester that the police, who some of us had great relationships with, are now firing on us. Sure, and I that think, hurts. I, I think the, the panic and anxiety and the mental health are all things that um, clearly these, these uh, events have major impact there. And I think we should get there at some point uh, during this conversation. But I, I'd like to, uh, I'd like Dr. Kamali, do you have a, do you have, uh, a sense of what the data shows uh, around the concerns around reproductive health with these chemical irritants? So the, the data is very limited. And in fact, there's really not much at all uh, that would support anything one way or the other. It really has not been studied. Uh, the uh, comments from Nurse Boswick about fear and how that can affect all sorts of things, I, I think are really poignant and I think they are uh, accurate and can affect things from a physiologic standpoint. Uh, in terms of data behind any reproductive uh, harm or menstrual cycle changes or that, there, there really isn't uh, much, if any, data uh, related to that. Okay, well, I, I'm sure, and Shani, you can probably speak to this better than I, but I'm sure there are a number of people right now in this community who would like to, uh, to address that, the lack of data, because um, certainly the fact that this has been sustained now for two, two and a half weeks and it's going to be sustained for longer, I'm, I'm certain, um, I think there is an opportunity to have some, some data around it as well. Shani, anything you want to mention there? Yeah, so there is actually a study coming out of um, uh, Minnesota right now. The University of Minnesota just started um, a tear gas and reproductive health. And so it's brand new. That's actually just started in the last couple of months that actually is studying the results of tear gas on a female reproductive system sponsored by Planned Parenthood. But there is no data yet. So they're just in their preliminary studies. Um, I agree. You know, I've had multiple um, people to reach out to me with uh, menstrual issues, concerns regarding uh, tear gas. And, you know, I agree with um, 
you know, the other folks in the panel that there is, you know, the, the fear component that also adds to stress. But, you know, I also encourage as well is that, you know, you know, other, other folks from across the country have, you know, had many months of, you know, people being exposed to these types of chemical irritants. And, you know, we are unaware of the actual long-term effects of what these things can do. And so, you know, that is why, you know, these, this data is actually needed. And I'm glad that at least, you know, the University of Minnesota has at least started this process. So. Absolutely. So I, that, I, may I, encourage, that may encourage the universities, nursing schools, medical schools in this area to start to look at that data because Rochester has become a war zone. And so it's time to study war here. Mm. Yeah. So speaking of, uh, of war zone, I want to go back to the conversation about the LRAD. Um, I was not down, um, this, and the LRAD was deployed. The LRAD uh, is essentially a, a noise that is louder than uh, you could possibly imagine. It stands for long range acoustical device. Uh, it was deployed one night. Uh, it was over at the corner of Child and Wilder Street. Um, in the in the west side of Rochester. I was not down there that night. Um, I'm not sure of anyone. Shani, were you down there that night at that at that particular intersection? What what day was that? Uh, that was when the LRAD went off. Were you physically present at that moment? So there were there have been multiple times where LRAD has been deployed. Hmm. So so the the one that I was present for and actually so to clarify, I have not been actively engaging in any of these protests. So I actually only my role is only specifically to manage the triage, um, the triage actions that are going on. So, you know, for the Saturday evening, the one where, you know, we were trapped in the church, the LRAD was deployed at that time. So I was there for that, yes. Okay, so I think, um, Dr. Kamal, you, I, I interrupted you earlier, but I think it's really important for folks to understand the potential uh, damage to uh, hearing from the LRAD, is there anything that you want to just add about that? My understanding of it is it's a very focused uh, sound beam, if you will, or sound waves in a particular direction, but can be very, very loud. Uh, the intent behind it would be that it would scatter people, if you will, from that immediate area so that the time spent uh, with those waves affecting your ears or yourself would be limited uh, and that the intent would be that it would not cause any lasting uh, damage or harm. Uh, however, again, similar to uh, the tear gas and capsaicin, that if you were in an area where it was uh, continuous for some time, then that could have consequences. Okay. Well, I, I know I've, I've been reached out to by several audiologists in the community who are incredibly concerned about the use of LRAD. And I would encourage anyone who is uh, listening, um, who listens to a recording of this to get in touch because uh, I'd be glad to connect them to those audiologists who really do have some major concerns if people are experiencing any uh, sustained hearing loss. Um, Shani, Nurse Bullock, anything you wanna add about the LRAD before we move on? So I wanted to say that I've had, I've had, I'm sorry, uh, audiologists that actually have reached out to us as well to volunteer their time as well. Great. And I, I just the other day I had a conversation uh, with Shawnee around the LRADs and we talked a little bit about it possibly triggering seizure activity. And so we wanted to, in this conversation, be sure to address seizure safety. And if someone at a protest has a seizure, that we are ensuring that they are safe, that we're not doing those old time things of sticking a spoon in somebody's mouth to stop them from swallowing your tongue. That is impossible. So we want to ensure that they are safe, that their garments are not choking them and that they're not injuring their head, that we are timing the seizure and that we are getting them help as soon as possible. If this L riot indeed will trigger a seizure or anything else that is going on down there with the bright lights, with the chemical activity, with all those things in one can trigger somebody who has uh, underlying seizure disorder to actually go into active seizure activity. So we just want to ensure that our community is prepared as possible for whatever comes our way during these peaceful protests. That's right. And, and I think that it's a, great, uh, it's a great segue into something that I know you want to talk about about Nurse Bowick, which is related to uh, just general uh, hygiene related to both the, the chemical irritants, but also to, to COVID. I mean, this is such an important thing that we have um, all, all, so many people 
um, in small spaces at once. I think the, the mask usage, I agree with Shani, the mask usage downtown at the protests has been uh, exceptional. Um, and I, I, I expect it'll stay that way. I, I've seen a lot of people walking around just squirting people with hand sanitizer when they need it. Um, and I think that's been uh, uh, tremendous as well. But, you know, things like PPE, you know, we talk, it's not just masks, even things like, um, like earplugs, uh, things of that nature, I, I think could be proved very helpful. So I just want to open it up to folks who want to weigh in on things that people ought to be prepared with um, and, and also best ways to address COVID while uh, down at the, at the protest. I think starting with remembering that when it comes to COVID-19, you are your best advocate. You are essential to you. And so it's important that you basically take charge of your health when it comes to the exposure, to ensuring that you're able to say, perhaps, you know, I've been at the protest for five nights, I need to take a night off. And for those people that are protesting every single night, that during the day, that they are getting some rest, that they are breathing in fresh air. And the thing I really wanted to add here is when you get home from the protest, to ensure that you, if you can, remove those clothes before you enter your home or as soon as you enter your home, that your protest clothes are washed separately from the rest of your laundry, that you are removing your shoes, that you are actually washing your shoes. If you're traveling by bicycle, that you're washing your bicycle. My truck was covered with a white film, that you're actually washing your vehicles and removing those chemical irritants from your person as quickly as possible. Because many of us are dragging those things right into our house. You know, people with young kids are going in, you know, little kids don't know that you just been to exposed to deadly chemicals and they're running to hug mommy and daddy. And so to just ensure that you're being as safe as possible and that as much as you can, a protest social distancing for the most part doesn't happen. But this community has done an outstanding job with masks, with supporting one another. Other people looking out, do you have a mask? Do you need water? Do you need hand sanitizer? We have truly come together on the front line to support one another. And I am thankful to be a resident of the city of Rochester at this time, at such a time as this, in the way that we can come together and help each other get through the war that we're in. Shani, Dr. Kamali, anything you'd like to add related to COVID and, um, and the way we can, uh, people can be prepared when they go downtown? Oh yeah, I, you know, just, uh, Adding on to the common sense uh, things of, yes, hand sanitizer, uh, masking, uh, the physical distancing, all those factors. And that if you have symptoms or think that you were exposed to get tested so that you can find out that if you are positive, so you can isolate and contact trace uh, all, those, all those factors. We are very fortunate uh, in as much as our community is in so much pain. Uh, we are so very fortunate to have a very great community of people that support one another. So uh, wearing a mask isn't just for you, it's for everybody else. The physical distancing isn't just for you, it's for everybody else. And the same goes with testing and seeking medical care. And I remember um, early in June when there were protests across the nation um, after uh, the death of George Floyd, uh, there were a number of studies that showed, or, or at least there were a number of, I shouldn't call them studies, that's inappropriate, but there were a number of articles uh, from uh, public health and medical experts saying that there actually was no significant uh, connection between uh, protests and, out and COVID outbreaks. Are, is anyone, any one of the three of you familiar with any of those articles, if there is actually research and data behind this, or if it was more kind of anecdotal at the time? Well, I think it's I read more, the same articles. Yeah. I read the same articles that you did mention. I did not see at this point any um, evidence that would suggest that the protests are linked to um, any outbreaks of COVID. I haven't at this far. Yeah, I would agree with that as well. I think the thought process here is that when people are outside, if someone is sick, that the virus dissipates in the outdoor air, uh, which is a very big difference from being indoors. Uh, and that's why from a medical perspective, we're trying to be very cautious of the number of people who are indoors together because the air is recirculated or you're in close proximity and might get a higher uh, viral load uh, for, of contamination, if you will. 
I'd like to open it up to any members of the media who have questions. I, I, I know there's still a couple topics that we'd like to cover, but I want to be mindful of people's time too and make sure people get questions off if they'd like to. Mitch? Hey, Patty. Yeah, so I'd like to go back to the, to the mental health part of, of that. Um, and not just the mental health of the people who were at the protest, but the mental health of the people throughout this community. What, what are we seeing, uh, uh, like, I don't know if it would be more ED or if it be more psych ED than what, than what you're doing, but what are we seeing about the, the mental health, anxiety, uh, Teresa mentioned fear, seeing in, not just in protesters, but also those of us watching it every night. And we have, you know, people who are watching have their own fears about what's going to happen as well as the people at the protest. How is that being addressed? What's being done? Uh, Shani, are medics there for mental health? You know, as, as well, talk about this whole mental health picture that's involved with these protests. So can I start? So, um, so right now, folks, we have, about, we have about 50 medics and we have about, I think we have about 40 um, mental health providers that are um, helping with this process. Um, we have people that are medical professionals that have about probably about 12 that had volunteered their time to help assist with this. And so we have um, the, the mental health professionals come, uh, there's, they're, in dis they're dispersed throughout the crowd every night, checking in with people, making sure that people are doing okay. And then there is a, there is a location that people can go to if they need help, that if they wanna talk about things um, and talk about the trauma that they face, then they can do so. Um, there also is a post, uh, a post um, a clinic that people can attend every Friday that's actually been going on for the last two weeks that has uh, mental health professionals there as well. And, um, you know, I will say that, you know, the, as much as we try to mobilize behind the scenes and get people that are willing to donate their time to this effort that, you know, we've seen multiple stages of, um, of stress that has affected us as uh, medical providers, uh, volunteers, people in the community. You know, we have 135 volunteers helping the medics and helping the medical professionals that are volunteering their time every night. Everybody is feeling um, feeling kind of the the crunch of that, though. You know, we are you know we are in the community, we're of the community, but we also are you know witnessing these these types of events go on every day. Plus, you know, things are changing so fast within the city. You know, we have so much going on at once. Um, there's a lot of reports of not sleeping, you know, just uh, high stress levels. There's a lot of like uh, crying. There's a lot of just people that need to talk things out. And so, you know, I, you know, I recommend obviously that if you have a medical professional, that if you have a mental health professional, that you speak to them immediately. You know, I know that there's an effort in the city to get people connected to care. And I am a huge, I'm a huge advocate for that being a um, internal medicine PA. So, you know, especially and also for the medics and the people that are on the front lines, you know, we are really trying to prioritize our own self-care just to make sure that we're taking care of ourselves because there's being so much demanded of us every single night. And so that is, I think, you know, that's kind of like the biggest picture that I can give you all right now. Yeah, and I, I would just chime in there, Patty. I've been down to the protests uh, and, and rallies several, several times, and every single time there's, uh, there has been some level of a program to this. I want to be clear. There, there is. This is. These are organized events, and I think um, you know if that's a really important thing for people who have not been down there to yeah. understand. And the during the, and I'm using the, the term program loosely, but during the lineup of speakers and things of that nature, I have never uh, seen one of those happen without talk of mental health, without people. Um, like, you know, Melanie Funches, who's a, certainly a, a leader in the, in the community, um, speaking to people about the importance of mental health and knowing that um, it, is, it is okay to remove yourself from what's going on there and make, and make sure you can talk to people. So I don't, I don't think that actually answers your question, Patty, because I, I would imagine that the, the medical professionals on the phone know this probably way better than me, but I think we're in the middle of a traumatic event and the, 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 the results and, and the impact of the trauma is not going to be known for quite some time. But I can tell you that everyone is very conscious of the fact that there's trauma going on and really encouraging people to be thoughtful and mindful about that. Because there's trauma on top of trauma. Everybody mentioned COVID just as, the, as far as proximity and safety. 
So we've had so much trauma in this community. If you want to go back really to, to March, you know, when, when we had the, the shutdown. So I guess I'm wondering, I mean, there's legitimate concerns about reproductive health with, with chemicals in the air. I understand that. But where also are the concerns being done and, and work being done around uh, gauging the community's mental health long term uh, on something like, like this with, with COVID, with protests, with unrest? We're going to have more of this. Investigations are going to start. So protests may start, stop, but mental health stress is going to be ongoing piled and piled and piled. I guess, Mike, you know I'm a big mental health person here. I just want, you know, as much awareness of that as physical yep. is the mental aspect of this because that may continue long after our streets are quiet. We still may have that little PTSD. I don't want to minimize that, but some PTSD from everything that we've gone through for this year. And Patty, you, Patty, you are absolutely 100% Right. And I also don't want to minimize the role of our beauticians and our barbers, because for those people that don't go to see a mental health provider and don't go to see a physician on a regular basis, they're having those conversations in the barbershops. They're having those conversations in the beauty salons. And so those folks are hearing it. And like Shawnee said, we hear about the insomnia. But what I'm also hearing a lot of is the grief. You know, people are not sleeping, but they are grieving. It's as if the Rochester that we know died. And as we protest for a resurrection, there is a loss here. You know, and, and you go through all the stages of grief. We want to be in denial and pretend this cannot be the Rochester that we know, but it truly is. And so as we accept our narrative today and start to build for a resurrection of our best selves in Rochester, we are truly grieving for the Rochester that we've lost since March and the repeated trauma, repeated trauma, repeated trauma. And Melanie Funches and her team is putting together some remarkable initiatives to move this community forward. Dr. Kamali? No, we said just gonna, uh, again, uh, multiple traumatic events. Uh, and it started with COVID, with shutdowns, uh, with economic pain and struggle, family pain, uh, knowing people that have died from COVID, and then the social injustice of adding up, seeing that happen in different areas around the country, and then having it hit home. Uh, and it's tough, and it's tough on the entire community and throw into that politics and an election uh, coming up too. It's, it's in incredibly stressful. Um, and talking with people, spot on, absolutely. Friends, family, anybody that you can, utilizing uh, the resources that we have available to us in our community, but also understanding that everyone is feeling it. Uh, frontline providers, Nurses, docs, techs in the hospital, paramedics, firefighters, police officers are all feeling it. Our whole community is strained. And I, I share in the sentiments that when we come to the other side of this, uh, that we can be a much stronger community. But it will take work. It will take continuous work, Patty, for all of us to keep pushing forward and working with one another. Thanks, any, I'll to somebody else now. <laughs> any additional questions from members of the media? Yes, um, hi. Uh, Mitch, this is a question uh, for you because I know um, the mayor recently extended her emergency order um, to prevent the spread of COVID-19 by not allowing huge groups of uh, people outside, especially late at night into the early morning. And we're starting to see uh, people start to uh, spend the night at City Hall, night or night. I was wondering if you could explain, if is, is the city being supportive of how they enforce this? And so uh, why? I'm sorry, you, you broke up a little bit at the end there. I think- Oh, sorry. I, can you just, can you uh, repeat the end of your question? I was wondering if you, if the city is being selective in how they enforce the mayor's executive order, not allowing huge groups of people throughout the night into the early morning, because now we are seeing people um, being at city hall every night. And I've been at a lot of these protests, and it seems like most people do wear masks there. There are some that don't, and now people are sleeping next to each other. Is the city being selective in how they? Um, how they enforce this? If so, why? 
Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I would say, I, I think the word you use, I did have a hard time hearing you. I think the word you use is, is the city being selective in the way they enforce it. And I would say, absolutely. Um, the executive order that you're describing, Tyler, is exactly that. It's an, exe it's an executive order. This was not something that was done in consult with the city council. So I, I can't really speak to the, um, to the, uh, the, the reasoning for the executive order or even the uh, the enforcement of it. I think what you know we have had at city council a number of public briefings over the past uh, several weeks that make it clear that there's uh, a, a lot of questions as to the selectivity of the way that things are uh, or, or, the, or the discretion that is or is not used in terms of the enforcement on these things. And I, I would repeat what Dr. Kamali said at the beginning. My goal, and I'm sure everyone's goal, who's on the Zoom right now, is very much to make sure that everybody has the opportunity to exercise the right to peacefully protest. Um, and, and if that, if that uh, decision to peacefully protest means sleeping at City Hall, I think that is absolutely um, uh, that the people's right to do that. The, the concern, I think, from a couple of days ago, which is potentially what you're addressing, was um, the, the employees at City Hall ability to get in and out of the building. And, and, and that, that is an issue. Um, but since that since that day where there was uh, uh, some interactions and I believe 16 um, arrests, um, there there has not been any uh, blockage of city hall employees getting in and out. Um, and I hear people talking about it at the People's Hall. Uh, people have a right to be down at City Hall, and um, I, I I believe that everybody has the right to exercise their peaceful their right to peacefully protest. But COVID, as long as people, you know, we have to remember that we are in a pandemic. And as everyone has said, we've done a pretty good job of, of masking up during this process. Any other questions from, uh, from the media? I think Rand Randy had one. No, maybe not. It's okay if I ask one for the medical experts. Sure, your, your connection, I don't know if it's just me, but I think your connection's a little tough, Tyler. Oh man. Hold on. <laughs> can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you, Tyler. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Um, for the local experts on the panel, I was just wondering, um, what advice would you give to the protesters who plan to sleep out there every night to avoid um, COVID-19, especially because, you know, people are having sleeping bags next to each other. There's hundreds of people on the sidewalks together. Uh, what what advice would you give to make sure that there is no spread of COVID-19 throughout the air as they are there nightly and sleeping um, on the sidewalks? Shawnee, did you want to take that? <laughs> yeah, I guess I would just say wear your mask. You know, don't take it off ever. You know, if you're going to be sleeping close to, if you're in close proximity to less than six feet, and you know, you're just gonna have to say good night to somebody with a mask on next to you and you're gonna also have to wear that mask. So it'll be, it's gonna be a warm night with a mask on, but that's what you need to do. So that's part of your, your right to protest. And um, you also have to, you have to exercise your right to protest, but then also make sure that you're keeping the person next to you safe. And I would just piggyback on that with, uh, to, to get tested. You know, if you're one of those people that are going to be protesting in close proximity, you know that you are that one that will stay all night or you're going to be naked out there to ensure that you are taking care of your personal health, that you are ensuring that you are seeing a medical uh, health provider, that you're actually being getting a, a checkup and that you get a COVID-19 test because we do have some people that have been out in the elements that have been naked. And so we, they've been exposed not only to COVID-19, but just to the elements and things that, you know, could expose them to other things. And so we do want to ensure that physical health is being ad addressed as well here. Um, can I just add to that real quick? And I would just say, you know, if you're gonna call, if you want a COVID-19 test, I would just say call and get a screening first. Um, if you start having symptoms like a nurse Bullock described that, you know, uh, uh, um, if you try, if you call University of Rochester or some of the other area organizations that are doing testing, they should be able to uh, properly uh, walk you through that process. And if they think that you need to have a COVID test, then they will direct you to have one. Uh, Dr. Kamali, anything you want to add on that or should we go to, uh, to the next question? Why don't we go to the to the next question? I think that was well covered. Okay, uh, Mr. Rose, go ahead. 
Hi there, this is Lowell Rose from Spectrum News. Um, I know in the past week, um, since the chief stepped down and since we had more of the more of the involved protests with the police and the pepper balls, things have been uh, different. On um, and I was wondering, have you all seen like a difference in um, the mental health, um, the mood of people protesting since um, police have been less engaging with those protesters? Um, just an observation out there so, since, we've, since the first week to now. Um, I would say that people are, um, I think people are afraid. I think people don't know what to expect. And so they're constantly on guard. And I think that's what happens when you're exposed to trauma repeatedly is that you expect one outcome, but you actually get another. And I think it, uh, it's kind of throwing people off. So when we talk about, you know, traumatic response and not being able to sleep or um, being able to process things correctly, um, you know, uh, aggression or just um, irritability. I think that that's one of those things. It's like, you know, people keep expecting to things to escalate, you know, even when there is no escalation from protesters because they just, you know, people don't know what to expect. And so, you know, the organizers, you know, like um, Mitch was saying, you know, have an organized protest and they want things to go a certain way where people are not being hurt. And so, you know, they, un, you know, they are not really trusting that the police are going to actually not hurt them. And so I think that that is really adding to the stress level of the protesters and adding to the stress level of the community as well, because people are watching the news all night long to make sure that their loved ones are safe out there. And, you know, same thing for the medics and the medical professionals and the mental health professionals that are standing uh, there working all night, standing all night to make sure that people are safe. And one more follow up. Um, since the protest started two weeks ago, since uh, we found out about um, Daniel Prude and the tactics that police have used, do you feel as though, or anyone, do you feel as though police relations with the community have worsened any, or do people see police in a different light now? You know, I, I really think that uh, that's, this particular topic of conversation is related to the health and safety of protesters. I think if you want to talk about that at the protests themselves, I think, you know, I would, I would just echo what Shawnee just said. There's, there is a lot of, uh, there's a lot of fear. Um, I'd also say that I've been down several nights and no night is, no night is like the last one, right? Every, every, everyone is very different. And I know I'm, I'm talking to a bunch of medical professionals and I'm not much of a scientist myself, but I, I would talk about the tension that's in the air. I know you can't really quantify that, but there's nights where you're down there and, and the, the energy and the tension, is, the energy is really positive. And there's no tension in the air. And there's nights where you're down there and the, the tension is incredibly thick. Um, and so I think that um, the more that we collectively, uh, everyone can focus on the really positive energy and the more that the law enforcement, and, and I want to be clear, it's not, it's not only RPD. There's been times where there's been uh, the state troopers. There's been times where there's been the, the sheriff's department. As long as, um, you know, we want law enforcement to focus on de-escalation, and de-escalation includes bringing the level of tension down. So, you know, Lowell, I'm, I don't think any of us are prepared to comment on the larger story of police community relations, but as it pertains to the protests themselves, you know, it, it all depends on the night you get down there. And frankly, I think it depends on, on, on um, the, the plan that law enforcement seems to have going into the evening. You're, you're absolutely right. And I think it was Tyler who mentioned the mandate to um, have folks off the streets, large, no large gatherings after 11 o'clock. Every night at 11 o'clock, I have a high level attention because I'm always like, okay, now that we've hit the 11 o'clock hour, is the police just going to open up on the protesters? Like now there is a mandate in place to say that there should not be any large gatherings. So I can tell you that at 11 o'clock at night, my level of stress goes up every night for the protesters. I wanna be, I wanna be mindful of time and uh, take, take one, maybe two more questions. Anyone else have any from the media? If not, then uh, I want to thank everyone for for being here. I want to um, I, I'll give everyone a chance to close out, Shani. I promise. Okay. Um, I just want to say thank you to the media for being here. Um, I think this is an important message to get out. I want to stress the fact that um, the the protests have been um, predominantly peaceful, 
and uh, will continue to be as this community continues to grieve, as Nurse Bowick said. And we want to make sure that people have an opportunity to be uh, prepared and to be safe. And knowing that we have people like uh, Shani and Nurse Bowick and Dr. Kamali in the community uh, means a lot to, to get us there. So I'd offer each person an opportunity to just close out. Shani, if you'd like to start. Um, so I actually just wanted to just say real quickly about what I believe a protester, if you're going to go down, you know, we already talked about it just a little bit, but just to make sure that we're, um, people are being, um, that they're wearing the appropriate equipment and, and gear when they're coming to these protests, it is strongly recommended that you not show up with just, I mean, just like a, a covering on your face and that's it. Um, if you're going to show up to these protests, you should be prepared. Um, so shatterproof goggles or a full face mask or respirator, which we have been, been circulated through the community through donations. If you need one, please contact the Rochester, um, Rochester City Medics. They, we will try to provide you with one or direct you how to get one. Um, I know that there's been people that the local um, Salvation Armies have been running out of helmets and like full face helmets, like motorcycle helmets, they've been running out of football padding that have been left over from people that have had kids that have cycled out of, out of those, out of like, you know, football, their football years, you know, so be prepared to um, put yourself in a position where your chest is protected, where your groin is protected if possible. Um, also, I know that some people have been making, um, making like, um, uh, there have been moms that have been making these uh, these shields for folks um, as long as they are safe and as long as you are um, making them to like out of some strong material then that's also recommended but sneakers also a, also a marker so that you can mark on yourself what your name is what your phone number is and also earplugs are especially important Rochester City Medics um, we will always have some. We have plenty of earplugs. So if you need some, please contact us. We'll make sure that you have some. We have some out on the street every night. And um, we also have been passing out goggles. We've been passing out water, um, supplies. You know, the medics, you, they're easily identifiable because they all have a red cross on their shirt. So if you need to talk with somebody, if you've been exposed to tear gas, just tap them on the shoulder and move out of the area so that they can attend to you. And then they will direct you either to a higher level medical professional like me or the other medical professionals that are, that are volunteering their time, or we will direct you to an emergency room as soon as possible. Thank you, Shani. Nurse Bowick? You know, I want to, you know, personally again say thank you to Shawnee and her team for being the boots on the ground medical team that's really taking care of people there, providing that that frontline treatment to people that are out there. And if you are choosing to go down and participate in a peaceful protest, let somebody know that you're going down there. You know, we have a, a number of young people that want to be there. They want to see it. They're sneaking out of the house to be there. Let your parents know if that is what you're choosing to do so that somebody know where you're at. And I want to remind us as a community not to forget our spiritual health in all of this as we address the physical health, as we address the mental health, not to forget the spiritual health and if you have a higher power if you have someone that you can connect with and talk to about what you're feeling and what you're experiencing it be your barber your beautician you know many people call into the radio station and we have these conversations on, on WDKX but please do not go through this time alone we are here for you and we want to support each other through this. And again, Dr. Kamali and, and Mitch, thank you so much. And thank you to the media for coming out and covering this very, very special health am amid the protest segment to get it out to our community. And Nurse Boak, I'm just gonna remind uh, the, the folks that Conkey Cruisers is playing, is doing a video of Good Trouble coming up. Yes, we are doing a free community screening of Good Trouble on Tuesday, which is National Voter Registration Day. And so we are celebrating the life and legacy of the late Congressman John Lewis. And so you can actually drive in, uh, you can ride your bike, or you can walk up that we will be socially distancing. If you don't bring a mask, we'll certainly give you one. But this is really a time to, when you look at the why you protest, here's an action item that you can, if you're not registered to vote, bring somebody and register them to vote. So that is another form of peaceful protesting. Thank you. And Dr. Kamali? 
So as an emergency doctor, as a physician, as a part of this community and working at, at Strong, uh, we operate 24-7. Uh, we see anybody uh, at any time for anything. Uh, but as a person, uh, my hope is that these uh, protests uh, stay peaceful and that we have no one injured at all. Uh, and that's my plea to the community. Our community is uh, very resilient. We need to really tap into that. That doesn't mean we don't need to talk about things. We absolutely do. We need to work towards a better future uh, and we need to come together. Um, so uh, I hope that things can really remain peaceful and that people don't get injured. Thank you. And I want to thank Will and Brianna, our ASL interpreters, um, for being here with us today. I want to thank Chip Partner and the whole team at URMC Communications. And I just want to thank everyone. This is probably not the end of this conversation. Um, and I'm confident that Dr. Kamali, Shani, and Nurse Bowick um, will be happy to do a follow-up, but hopefully we won't need to. We'll be celebrating peaceful protests. So thank you everyone and have a, have a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.